Good evening, everyone. Um, today is, oh, uh, let me start again. Good evening, everyone. Uh, today is Monday, and it's May, uh, June 15th, 2020. Uh, it is June 15th, 2020. And today we are... Um, just today, I'm actually, uh, my, uh, my Logitech camera just came, and so right now I'm using it, and I kind of like the font because it looks a bit different, like, it looks better than the other camera I had, and so, oh, my, web, the web camera that I had, uh, that I was using for my computer, so I really like that one, um, so, uh, today we are looking at uh, fundamentals of Christian education. And of course, as I mentioned in the first video, this is for uh, people that would like to have the Christian mindset or even, the, even if they're not Christian, but they would like to uh, give their children a Christian education. And just to know uh, how good the, the sound system is, let me know in the comments to see uh, if, if you can hear me perfectly okay or if I should use my other uh, camera. And we're going to start. Today we are looking at, uh, I'm going to break this part into two parts because it's about, um, it's about seven pages or eight pages long. And it, it is in the, the title is called the, the book is called Fundamentals of Christian Education, and the title is called Proper and Edu Proper Education. And today we are looking at the in the subtitle called Importance of Home Training. And so we're gonna see what are the uh, attributes, uh, the qualities that come with home training, of course, in the Christian mindset. And it begins. If you listen to the, if you were here on Friday and you listen to the, to the, to the physical decline of the race, then this is just a continuation of that part with a different title. As you know, that uh, in the physical decline of the race, people were not living as long as they used to. Or, and when they were born, uh, compared to those that lived before the flood, and if they, even after the flood, People, nobody were, nobody was born blind, deaf, or um, imbecile, or anything like that. And now we have it as a common thing. And so um, she begins to say, "I inquired if this tide of woe could not be prevented, and something be done to save the youth of this generation from the from the ruin which threatens them." I was shown that one great cause of the existing deplorable state of things is that parents do not feel under obligation to bring up their children to conform to physical law. And so um, the thing is, we have physical laws that we need to abide by. Let me, let me do something real quick. And so, if we don't abide by the physical laws, then we cannot we cannot uh, expect to to get the same uh, reaction of what we used or what we we would have if we had a, uh, if we had lived according to the to the law. Uh, let me actually quickly do something here. As we move on, and so 
And so what um, what happens, people don't live as long as they would because they are not uh, living according to, to the law that God has put in place. So now, mothers love their children with an idol, idolatrous love and indulge their appetite when they know that it will injure, injure them, their health and thereby bring upon them disease and unhappiness. This cruel kindness is manifested to a great extent in the present generation. The desires of children are gratified at the expense of health and happy tempers because it is easier for the mother for the time being to gratify, to gratify them than to withhold that for which they clamor. So what do we have here? Um, so parents, this is why I said this, uh, this uh, series is for parents who would like to have, uh, who like to give their children a, um, a Christian mindset education because what we do what parents do is if if their children uh, uh, if their children ask for something that something they like not necessarily not necessarily something good and the parents don't the parents don't want to make a, an issue in the home what they do is they they just give it to them even though they know that it is not good for them, they give it to them because they want to have peace. And that is called, actually, she is idolatrous love. What is idolatrous love? Well, what is the term idolatry? You know, idolatry is putting anyone before God. And so if you put your children before God, you are becoming an idolatrous person. And if you love your children more than you love God, then you have an idolatrous love. And so it is not good to, to, uh, to give to your children that which you know is bad for them because in the long run, you're going to regret it. And so indulging appetite, of course, she's been mentioning that because nowadays, even in this country, you will see young children already in a state of obesity um, because mm, parents are not teaching them self-control. You know, I mentioned on Friday, I think, if you train your body, because your brain is smarter than you are, if you train your brain to and your stomach to, um, to prepare for, uh, for food at a certain time, trust me, it will prepare for food at a certain time. If you eat every five hours without eating without eating in between meals, then after you eat in exactly five hours or five and a half hours, your stomach will start um, growling, meaning it's preparing acidity to receive food because it knows that in this time, you're going to have food coming in. So it's already preparing for that. But if you indulge in appetite, then your stomach is not sure when you're gonna eat, when you're not gonna eat. And if you have somebody who is guiding you, who is unsure of where to go, then you know you're going the wrong way, possibly. So, thus mothers are sowing the seed that will spring up and bear fruit. The truth, and when she says mothers, don't think it's, it's simply mothers. We have to understand that in the time that she was living, Mothers were the ones staying home, and the and the and the fathers were were working. Today's age, we have uh, more likely an equal employment 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 between men and women, and so it could be the mom even today. It could be the dad too sometimes. So it, don't just think it's sexist. It's according to the time she was living that she wrote this, but of course she wrote it for her time in our time as well in the future time. So if you're the one that stays home and take care of the children most of the time, then you can apply that to you, either the man or the woman. 
The children are not educated to deny their appetites and restrict their desires. And you know what's, what's interesting is that happens a lot when the parents give the the parents give the and that happens with mostly with mothers. That's why I'm gonna say mothers. It happens mostly with mothers. Because now we have a growing trend of single mom. And so because most of the guys either are in jail or they got divorced and they have to pay um child support and alimony. So it's not that I'm bashing on women, but things happen that makes women suffer more. And so most single mothers, because and, and if they have sons, they don't know how to make to get the son to become a man. And so the son gets away with many things. And here, even today, you can give your your children uh, food. And let's say you want um, to um, teach them to live without eating fish or meat or anything things like this. And your child is like, I want some chicken or some fish. And you give them the food without any of that, and they don't want to eat it. And the tendency is, to go and then get the meat or get the fish for them so they can eat. And that is what we call appetite. If they are if they are really hungry, they were gonna they're gonna eat the food whether it has meat or not. And so as they become selfish, exacting, of course, exacting. So they become selfish because they don't want to give it to somebody else because they think it's their food. They become exacting because it doesn't have fish or meat in it. Then they then they, are, they then they get angry, disobedient because they don't want to. They become selfish, exacting, disobedient, unthankful, and unholy. Well, guess what? They become disobedient because they don't. Want, the parents say eat the food and they say no. They don't want to eat that food because it doesn't have fish or meat in it, which becomes an exacting child. And they become unthankful because they don't, they, they, they would not say thanks to mom or dad for, for giving them that food. While if they were in the other countries, they would have been glad to have that kind of food. And of course they become unholy. Why? Because they are breaking the fifth commandment. What does it say? Honor thy mother and thy father, right? Yes. And of course, they're also breaking uh, that rule from Ephesians chapter 5, chapter 6, verse number 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And so these children, they grow up, and even though they grow up in a Christian home, sometimes that Christian home does not uphold the Christian value. Mothers who are doing this work will reap with bitterness the fruit of the seed they have sown. They have sinned against heaven and against their children, and God will hold them accountable. And so parents or guardians or teachers, if you think that um, I think a certain way is not going to go against you in the future or for you in the future, maybe you should think again. If your children become old and they depart from the Lord, two things can happen. It's either you did all that you could, and yet, of course, because they had bad uh, acquaintances in school and things like that, they ventured other way, or you did exactly what she's saying, indulging them into anything they like, and, of course, you lose their salvation, and it's going to be on your head. At the end, had education for generations back been conducted upon altogether a different plan, the youth of the generation would not now be so depraved and worthless. And today, if you think about it today, we have a pretty depraved generation of young people. Social media is a big uh, part of that. And... So yeah, I'm not gonna go there. I'm not gonna go there. The managers, the managers, the managers and teachers of schools should have been those who understand physiology and who had an interest not only to educate the youth in the sciences, 
but to teach them how to preserve health so that they might use their knowledge to the best account after they had obtained it. There should have been connected with the school's establishments with, for, carrying, for carrying on various branches of labor that the, that the students might have employment and the necessary exercise out of school hours. And so when you get to school, if you think about it, uh, if you go to school and you have to study, that's all you have to do is go to school and study. Most of the time what happens is you, you think you have a lot of time and so you start um, procrastinating. But when you actually go to school and you have to go to work and then your, your hours are now tight, then your mind is more focused into studying and you can do much work in, in an hour and a half than you would have done in three hours if you had that long of a time. Because when you have so much time, your mind can wander into other things, you know, what should I do, what should I eat? But when you, have, when you only have an hour and a half to do something, then your mind is focused and it just gets done even sometimes less than an hour and a half because you're just focusing on that one thing. You're not wandering around what, what else you could do. So that's another thing. The student's employment and amusement should have been regulated with reference to physical law and should have been adapted to preserve them to them the healthy tone, the healthy tone, the healthy tone of business um, of all the powers of body and mind. Then a practical knowledge of business could have been obtained while their literary education was being gained. Students at school should have, should have had their moral sensibilities aroused to see and feel that society has claimed upon them and that they should live in obedience to natural law so that they can, by the existence and influence, by precept and example, be an advantage and blessing to society. It should be impressed upon the youth that all have an influence that is constantly telling upon society to improve and elevate or to lower and debase. The first study of the young school of the young should be to know themselves and know and how to and, and how to keep their bodies in health. And so at the end of the day, the young people need to know that when they get older, they can be two things for society. They can either be an influence, an influence to elevate and ennoble others, or they can be an influence to debase and lower others. Meaning everything that is wrong, that you think is in the Christian mindset, wicked or evil, is a debasement of the generation. Anything that is good and holy is then is called an uh, improvement and elevation or ennobling in the Christian mindset. And so on which side are you going to be? At the end of the day, you can be either one of these. You can either be good or evil. You can either improve people's lives or lower their lives. You can ennoble their lives or you can debase their lives. It's going to be either one. At the end of the day, you can be either for Christ or for Satan, there is no middle ground. So you're going to have to choose how you want to raise your children to become what they should become in the future. Many parents keep their children at school nearly the year round. These children go through the routine of study mechanically, but do not retain that which they learn. Actually, that kind of happened to me when I was in um, high school. I was studying history. I had a history class. I hated that class so much because I could never understand anything. I would study everything, but I, I would still not understand until my dad was sitting next to me and he saw that I was studying very hard. And whenever I gave him the book so I could see if I knew everything, and he said he saw that I could not return anything. So instead, what he told me was, okay, let's sit down and let's put it together. 
And as he started reading it, he started to explain to me the history that is being that is written in the book. And when he explained that to me, now I understood what I was studying. And I actually, I actually stopped studying because I could just understand what was said. And now I memorized everything without studying the whole thing. And then when I got to class and they asked me a question, I was able to understand and explain because now I understood. And sometimes we study um, to memorize things, but we don't study to understand. And when you understand something, you don't need to memorize it anymore because it's already in your brain. It's like mathematics. You know mathematics? Uh, that's, that's the best example I can find. Mathematics, uh, you can study um, formula as long as you want, but if you don't understand the concept behind it, then you're going to fail anyways because you cannot really just study math. You have to practice and you have to understand what you are doing. And once you understand it, then anything they can throw at you is easy to do. So don't forget that part. Many of these constant students seem almost destitute of intellectual life. The, mono the monotony of continual study weaves the mind and they take but little interest in their lessons. And to many, the application, of, the application to books becomes painful. They have not an inward love of thought and an ambition to acquire knowledge. They do not encourage in themselves habit of reflection and investigation, meaning they don't try to understand. They want to just memorize everything by heart, by heart, by heart, by memory, without understanding what they are doing. And so when you, when you open the Bible, when you open the Word of God, and you think of studying just to study, you need to study to understand. Second Timothy chapter two verse fifteen says, "Study to show thyself, study to show thyself approved unto God, a man rightly dividing, not ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth." We have to study to understand, so that when others ask questions, we may know how to explain to them. Actually, if it's not in Second Timothy. It's going to be in the first Timothy chapter 2 verse 15. But I don't know what sure it's chapter 2 verse 15. It could be first or second, but I think it's first Timothy or second Timothy, one of them. You know what? Let me actually look right now to make sure I give you the right reference. I'm going to say it's in first Timothy chapter 2. Nope, I was right. It's second Timothy chapter 2. Yes, Second Timothy chapter two, verse fifteen: Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not rightly dividing the word of truth. Second Timothy Second Timothy two, verse fifteen. So, children are in great need of proper education, in order that they may be of use in the world. But any effort that exalts intellectual culture above moral training is misdirected. Well, so let me say this. Uh, you may be very smart, but if you don't have a moral compass, then you are a fool. I must say it again. You may be very smart, you may have gone to school and have all A's and a 4.0 GPA, GPA. If you don't have moral compass, you're a fool. Instructing, instruct, if you know what a moral compass is, then you know what I'm, what I'm, what I'm saying. If you don't know what it is, then go and try to find out what it means to have a moral compass or a moral uh, sound judgment. Go find out what it is. Instructing, cultivating, polishing, and refining youth and children should be the main burden with both parents and teachers. Close reasoners and logical thinkers are few for the reason that false inferences have checked the development of the intellect. And so, 
false influences have checked the development of intellect. That means you may be smart, but the person who is teaching you may be an evil person. Lots of knowledge, but no moral compass. And so they, they think that like, they can teach you that anything is okay. You can do whatever you want to do. Actually, you can even make that statement, that uh, that satanic that satanic statement, do what thou wilt. So if you have a, a, a um, an influencer who is telling you, do what thou wilt, it's okay, whatever you do is okay, then you know you don't have a moral compass. The supposition of parents and teachers that continual study would strengthen the intellect has proved erroneous, for in many cases, it has had the opposite effect. So you see people that have gone to school, very bright and smart, but yet they go out in the world and they commit the worst crime ever you can think of. Right? That happens. They go to school, they have, they were very smart, but yet they go break into people's house. They go break into people's cars and they go to prison. Why? The answer I said it earlier. Because the person who is influencing them is a satanic person. Sometimes it's their own peers that influence them into doing certain things that are lawfully wrong. In the early education of children, many parents and teachers fail to understand that the greatest attention needs to be given to the physical constitution, that a healthy, a healthy condition of body and brain may be secured. It has been the custom to encourage children to attend school when they are mere babies needing a mother's care. When of a delicate age, they are frequently crowded into, an, into ill-ventilated schoolrooms where they sit in wrong positions and poorly constructed benches, and as a result, the young, are tender and the young and tender frames of some have become deformed. So, that happens. If you go to school nowadays, I think that they're making it better where you have a chair where you can sit with your back on the back of the chair. When I was growing up, there wasn't any such a thing. It was a bench, and you have to sit straight on your on your own. And of course, after a time, as children after a time, as as young children after the time, as young children after a certain time, you become like this. Oh, I wanna bend. Um, bend my, my back in a bowl shape. And so we, we have to learn to sit straight. And because we have don't have anything for our back to sit straight, then what happens is the young children, they, they start growing with a deformed backside. The, deposit, the disposition and habits of youth will be very likely to be manifested in mature manhood. You may bend a young tree into almost any shape that you choose. And if it remains and grows as you have bent it, it will be a deformed tree and will ever tell of the injury and abuse received at your hand. You may, after years of growth, try to strengthen the tree, but all your efforts will prove unavailing. It will ever be a crooked tree. This is the case with the minds of youth. They should be carefully and tenderly trained in childhood. They may be trained in the right direction or in the wrong. And in their future lives, they will pursue the course in which they were directed in youth. The habits formed in youth will grow with the growth and strengthen with the strength and will generally be the same in afterlife, only continually growing stronger. So, parents and teachers, you know what, let me do this, actually. 
Parents and teachers, I got news for you. You have a big job to do. If you have children, parents, if you have children, teachers, which you do because you have at least at least 20 to 30 children in your class, you have a big thing to do. You see, as, as she said in here, if you burn a tree who's growing up, if you burn it into many directions, it's gonna, and, you, and you keep it going that way, it's gonna be crooked. Excuse me. If you train your children, if you bend their mind in the wrong direction, into lustful appetite, into being exacting, into being disobedient, into being unthankful, unholy, when they get older and you try to bring them back to the right path, it could be too late. It could be too late. And if you want your children to grow into mature men and mature women, being uh, helpful for society, being a good influencer to those that are coming to the next generation so that they may live according to the principle of God, then you need to do your part into teaching them what God's requirement, requirement are. You need to instruct the child into the way in which he should go so that when he gets older, he will not depart from it. And here, Solomon is speaking about the way of God, not the way of Satan. So don't forget that. If you didn't get anything, think about a tree. If you bend a tree, make it crooked, and let that tree grow, when it becomes a mature tree or a big tree, and you try to put it back into its normal state, it will never, ever, ever be straight again. It will forever be crooked. And that will tell of your action. If you train your children to become disobedient, to become unholy, unthankful, exacting, lusting, after things, watching anything they want, saying any words they want, eating whatever they want, hanging out with anybody they want. When they get older, and you try to tell them, you cannot eat this, you cannot go there, you cannot hang out with that person, trust me, you're going to regret it big time. So, please, if you want to have a Christian mindset, now is the time. If your child is young, now is the time to turn around and teach them according to the Bible principles. Because when they get older, then they will stick with it. We are almost done. Actually, it may be, I may have to do that one in three parts. Possibly. I don't know. You know what? I think I'm going to finish it right here so that when I do the next one, it may spend the same amount of time. So, um, we are done for today. So, what did we learn today? Importance of, tra of home training. Um, see, I don't have children. Uh, thank God. I don't have a wife. Thank God. I don't have a fiancé. Thank God. I don't have a girlfriend either. Thank God. Actually, I, I've never had a girlfriend. Anyways, thank God. But if God were to tell me that I need to get a girlfriend, then thank God for that too. If he says, okay, you, you, have, you have done your step, you need to become a few, you need to um, 
ask her out to become your wife in the future, thank God I'll do it too. And if we do get married one day, thank God I'm happy that I have a wife. And if we do get children, I can I can say this one thing. What I'm learning here, I have already started to practice them into other children's lives. Not mine. Right now, I'm actually a childless parent, meaning I have children, but not mine. I, I help children from other people that I've come close to from my church and my neighborhood. And so everything I'm learning here and I'm, I'm also um, teaching here, I'm also practicing it to other people's lives. So far, three books that I've been reading when it comes to raising children. One is called Adventist Home. And that's for Seventh-day Adventists. But of course, if you'd like to learn that too, you can always um, look it up on uh, the uh, something called Adventist Bookstore Center, Adventist Home, ABC Center, or AB, AB Center, or call it ABC, Adventist Bookstore Center. Um, you can look for a book called Adventist Home. The second book you can also find there is called Child's Guidance. Child's Guidance. And the third book is Fundamental of Christian Education. And right now I'm reading that those two books, Child's Guidance and Fundamentals of Christian Education. And I can tell you, I have learned many things that m many parents have not learned. So, to you here that is listening, or to anyone who's going to be listening in the future, these videos, this series that I'm making, is for everyone who would like to see their children grow into mature men and, and women that bring help to society. And of course, at the end of the day, you have to praise God for that, because he's the one that will help you raise your child into becoming a man of valor in society. Anyways, today was Monday, May, oh, June 15th, 2020. We will see you again in on Wednesday, June 17th, 17th, 2020. And if I don't see if I don't see you on Wednesday or if I don't see tomorrow at all, because I can die any day. I hope to see you again. And I hope this video uh, help you in your walk and in raising your children. But if I don't see you at all, I hope to see you again when Jesus Christ comes the second time. Until then, bye for now.